and uh, pleasure to be uh, giving this talk uh, to especially, um, and I was specially instructed to aim it at the non-experts, uh, and uh, so therefore the experts in the audience, it'll all be very ho-hum for you. So I warned you, uh, and I'm not going to answer the question for the program, as, uh, so it's not like uh, we are going to settle that in this talk. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, to address what Lars said is only in the sense of uh, a kind of a state of the subject, uh, sort of a report, what is, a, uh, what is operationally string theory right now. Uh, so I'll try to give you a perspective. And, uh, and so in fact, to explain my title, I should uh, dwell a little bit on the title of our program, uh, because uh, I think it's probably the first program at KITP with a question mark in it. <laughs> no, there have been others. Okay, great. <laughs> but any case, but it, uh, it, it uh, uh, you, you might wonder why uh, this title. Uh, uh, so, firstly, uh, the title is a homage to uh, Joe Polsinski, uh, who was uh, here for so many years, uh, and uh, about 30 years ago, he wrote a set of lecture notes. Uh, with that title, What is String Theory? Uh, and, um, and he was himself, uh, he was himself motivated by the question that Ken Wilson had asked some more decades back, uh, called What is Quantum Field Theory? Uh, and as part of uh, Wilson's uh, attempt to get to the bottom of the organizing principles of quantum field theory, which as all of you know, led to, uh, uh, led to a deepened understanding and it sort of shaped our modern understanding of uh, what quantum field theory is and uh, through the renormalization group and so on. Um, uh, so what Joe was aiming at was something similar for string theory. Uh, and. Um, so, uh, so, but uh, okay. Um, uh, so you want to. Uh, so, uh, so the uh, uh, to understand why this question is being asked, what is string theory? Uh, to appreciate that for for an outsider, like I mean, as uh, Lars said, it's not often that you ask the question. I mean, uh, what is astrophysics or what is uh, condensed matter physics? Uh, so, uh, so why, why are we asking this question? Uh, so, uh, for that, the subtitle of the program is, I guess, a hint uh, to that. The subtitle, so the full title is What is String Theory? Weaving Perspectives Together, uh, uh, Piecing Together Perspectives. Uh, so it's, um, uh, so, um, uh, so one way to kind of, uh, maybe a kind of slightly flip way to answer the question, what is string theory? Something that David, who isn't here unfortunately today, likes to say is whatever string theorists do, of course. Uh, it's only slightly flip, and because in a sense, um, uh, a string theorists do many, many different things, and that's part of the reason why we are having this program. It's a many-faceted subject, and, um, and, uh, and there seemingly these have very little to do with each other at first sight. So in a way, our program is trying to tie together many of these perspectives and, uh, and uh, sort of, again, go towards what Joe was uh, aiming at, uh, the underlying uh, organizational principles that tie together these different perspectives. So, so what are these perspectives? Uh, so for that, let me uh, um, uh, uh, give you a bit of a potted history of the subject of string theory. So, so it's history only in the sense of a theoretical physicist, so it's not in any sense to be taken seriously very uh, coarse-grained history. So you could sort of divide string the history into certain kind of uh, uh, eras, uh, uh, and uh, there's a reason to, to do that. So from its origins in the late 60s to something like the mid-70s. Uh, can you read at the back? Uh, OK, great. Um, string theory originated and was viewed as a theory of the strong interaction, uh, and uh, which, of course, now you could, uh, in hindsight, think of it as uh, something that was 
uh, trying to describe what we more familiarly talk in terms of QD, QCD or young Mills gauge theories. Uh, but, um, but indeed, the advent of QCD uh, in the mid-70s uh, and several problems that I will mention later in the strong interactions uh, meant that uh, uh, people uh, people abandoned this approach to the strong interactions and um, uh, and instead around the same time it was realized quite kind of fortuitously that um, string theory the uh, formalism it actually it seems to capture many aspects of quantum gravity uh, something that it wasn't designed to do or was never the intention um, but it certainly uh, gave a way to uh, uh, to uh, to uh, to ameliorate some of the problems that you have in quantizing gravitons uh, in uh, in the scattering of gravitons you 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 would you could uh, have a quantum mechanically sensible uh, answer unlike most of the conventional field theoretic approaches to quantum gravity so this was sort of uh, so uh, so the so the focus shifted entirely. Uh, in the mid 80s, thanks to, uh, uh, to a, a sort of a deepened understanding uh, of, uh, of string theory, it was realized that it would not only describe quantum gravity, but potentially also particle physics uh, in the sense of, in the sense it, wa uh, it um, was being explored at the time in, uh, very naturally incorporating many of the ideas of the uh, of grand unified theories and uh, and in particular uh, the standard model uh, uh, and to some extent there was also explorations of cosmology um, from the mid 90s uh, yet another facet uh, opened and in a sense until now, in which you had this, this, but also back to gauge theories, sort of closing the circle in some ways. Uh, so now you had this sort of uh, theory which uh, uh, of this uh, subject in which all these different facets kept opening up and um, uh, and each of these is a very wide topic in itself and uh, gives a totally different perspective. Uh, and, um, uh, and of course, this is just a very coarse-grained history, but uh, in each of these periods, I think these perspectives have also deepened enormously. Uh, and, um, uh, and we have been, in fact, been able to do even within this period, which roughly coincides with the time from Joe Polczynski's lecture notes, and in fact, the time when I was a graduate student, that the, those lecture notes came out when I was a beginning graduate student. Uh, but from that time, we have uh, we have been able to do things which could only be fantasized uh, at that time. So, and I'll try to uh, uh, try to convey some of that uh, in this talk. So, um, so yeah, coming back. Uh, to these uh, perspectives. Uh, so new facets are, of course, always very exciting. And, uh, and a sort of a sociological thing, which is maybe not so appreciated, is uh, that it allows people with different motivations and different intuitions to take part in the subject. So you may not care anything about quantum gravity, but you might you might want to know about particle physics or gauge theory dynamics uh, or vice versa. And uh, there's a sort of a uh, and the, 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 the subject sort of brings in these different mo uh, these motivations, these points of view, and is able to, and, it, and uh, that's been helpful in this process of deepening. But at the same time, you're in the position of this old Indian uh, fable, uh, all of you probably know about the six blind folks and the elephant. Uh, so uh, you know, there's this big elephant and there's six blind people who go trying to feel it. Someone says it's a, uh, uh, feels the tail and says it's a rope. Someone feels the leg and says it's a tree. And someone else has, uh, says it's a wall and a spear and whatnot. Uh, so it's uh, so you so you are you feel a bit in that 
position. Uh, and in fact, in our workshop, we have six different themes, uh, and uh, all of us blind folks trying to, uh, 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 to put these themes together. But for the present purposes, I won't go into all those themes, but I'll just stick to um, the three, three that I've sort of cropped up. So quantum gravity. Uh, and the dynamics of gauge theory. So, um, uh, so uh, uh, as you will all appreciate, these are uh, long-standing questions. I mean, these are subjects that predate string theory, have uh, long-standing questions, uh, unanswered. Uh, and, uh, and the whole history. And um, uh, uh, so uh, there is a certain amount of cognitive dissonance that comes when you're trying to switch between perspectives uh, of these things. And that, I think, has been very creative in our subject. That tension has been very creative because you, you are trying to approach the same question from one or the other viewpoint. And, uh, and that's what lends uh, some of the um, magic to it. Uh, I'll concretize it uh, soon. So, so as I said, the aim of this program is to try to move towards a synthesis which would kind of try to at least piece together uh, this elephant and uh, or, or a giant jigsaw puzzle or whatever your favorite metaphor is. Uh, so this, uh, let me just close this introduction by quoting from Joe from those same lecture notes. Uh, he says, I think there's good reason to expect that an equally powerful organizational principle remains to be found. The nature of this organizational principle is at this point quite open and may be very different from what we, use, what we are used to in quantum field theory. So uh, again, harking back to Wilson, he thinks that uh, we have not yet found it and it's likely to be very different. And indeed, the quigs mutually kind of putting all these three different things into uh, the same uh, sort of a framework is, uh, is a is a big task and uh, uh, and likely to be very different from uh, just the ones that we are familiar with. So I won't try to kind of, uh, I mean, all of us are bewildered enough by all these different perspectives, so I won't try to uh, just bewilder you further, but uh, what I'll, and in fact, I won't be able to do justice to all these different uh, uh, perspectives. So my title, What String Theory Is, and so called 2024, uh, is in a sense to just tell you what string theorists are doing now and from a particular perspective, uh, which will at least give you a sense, and it's a perspective which uh, may be a little more familiar to uh, the non-experts in the audience, uh, since it starts from a focus on, uh, on this side. But I'll try to kind of indicate how uh, this has uh, this has sort of uh, helped to uh, um, uh, to to shed or illuminate some aspects uh, of this, or at least give a very new point of view on these things. So, um, so for me, at least, and it's a personal perspective. You listen to any of the other participants here, you'll get multiple other perspectives. Uh, and I encourage you to uh, to talk to people to uh, to get uh, get these other ones. Uh, so um, uh, so the gauge theory dynamics uh, uh, um, is I mean gauge theories are things that we learn starting from electromagnetism, and indeed I'll go back to electromagnetism in a moment. But uh, but I feel it gives a kind of a natural way from in things that we know uh, about how a framework of extended objects like strings uh, naturally should arise. And um, so, uh, so I'll give you a kind of a sense for that. Um, so, uh, 
So again, let's go back to history a bit, even further back. Um, and, uh, uh, but uh, what I'll say is sort of from the modern day perspective, it's probably a little dangerous, but, uh, but let's see. Uh, so we just go back to Maxwell and Faraday. I mean, when we, so the things that we learn in high school, uh, where we have charges, uh, and then you draw these lines of flux. So, so you have all these lines of flux uh, between opposite charges. Uh, and uh, this was, of course, uh, for electric flux, uh, magnetic flux. And this is sort of a very visualizable way of, uh, um, uh, of uh, understanding the electric or electromagnetic field. Uh, and in fact, uh, but what is, uh, I mean, we see these pictures, but then we quickly move on to Maxwell's equations. But I think what is not often appreciated is that Maxwell himself first tried to write down equations for these objects, for these. He tried to build some very intricate mechanical models of, it, uh, of these lines of flux. He, he thought that you should try to, that's the natural object for which you should um, describe the dynamics. Um, and in fact, Faraday had this picture in terms of the number of how many lines of flux cut the surface and so on. But, but he didn't succeed. In a sense, that two f these lines, uh, it was a good idea, but not the right context, so to say. Uh, and he didn't succeed. And of course, he went on to uh, write the equations, which we all no, but actually, even later, people like Dirac uh, felt after the quantum theory that maybe there's a Dirac tried to revisit these ideas by trying to, by had this hunch that in the quantum theory, these lines of flux, which are of course continuous, I've just drawn a few, uh, become somehow discretized. And, and, and then he thought that it might be easier to write down equations for these discretized lines of flux. But, but again, he didn't succeed either. Uh, so, but just to uh, uh, this thing that uh, this idea has been there for a while. But uh, once QCD was sort of uh, developed in the mid 70s, uh, people, uh, 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 people in particular, Nambu, Gold, uh, Mandelstam, and so on, um, uh, went back, in a sense, to this idea uh, and realized that in strongly interacting gauge theories like QCD, um, uh, you can, uh, they in fact tried to reconcile the string picture, uh, which had gotten some things right about the strong interactions. So uh, what it had gotten right, I should probably say, it, it, it gave a very nice, picture of the spectrum of these, or regi trajectories of these mesons. Uh, it was a very simple way to capture that with the string. So this was good, but what it didn't get right are sort of the scattering amplitudes uh, of these strongly interacting uh, mesons. Uh, so, uh, and it got it badly wrong, because if you, uh, and uh, the experiments that led to the validation of QCD, uh, uh, the deep and elastic scattering experiments, they show that the scattering amplitudes typically go as a power law. They go like one over the some uh, uh, kinematic invariant, whereas in string theory, things go like are exponentially suppressed. Uh, and so that's very badly off. And so people didn't find, couldn't see how to reconcile these things. That was part of the reason why you know, uh, doesn't appear in this period uh, over here. Um, and, uh, but, people, uh, but people nevertheless having this theory of QCD, which seemed like a very nice generalization of Maxwell's theory, uh, tried to go back to this idea of these flux tubes and realize that the behavior is qualitatively different in the strong interactions. The flux tubes, at least, uh, in the usual vacuum, now let's say you have a quark and an antiquark, uh, the, the flux tubes are sort of very highly collimated. Uh, they don't sort of spread around. 
they are highly collimated in a tube, uh, a flux tube, if you wish. Uh, and uh, this is a bit like in the Meissner effect uh, in superconductors, where you have uh, uh, the magnetic lines of flux are kind of um, effectively confined to a, a, a thin tube. Uh, so. The QCD vacuum or the strong interaction vacuum, the, con the confining vacuum, is believed to have this property. And in fact, numerical simulations uh, show the presence of this sort of a flux tube. Uh, but it still didn't seem to be the right object because, firstly, they're quite fat. These are not kind of thin strings. They, are, uh, they have a thickness set by the scale of the strong interactions. and. Um, uh, and um, uh, and besides, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, so again, the problems that I mentioned here uh, uh, still remained, and uh, you couldn't get a string moving in uh, in in this in flat space uh, uh, to to reproduce uh, these amplitudes. But it played a kind of a, a role. But people thought that. Uh, uh, so uh, people thought that it was sort of an effective description. Uh, so you have this effective description of this. Uh, there's a fat string which captures some things right. It has a tension uh, like a string does. Uh, it, and that tension sets the scale for the excitations, uh, the spectrum, et cetera. Uh, it, um, uh, it gives the sort of linear potential which you expect for a confining theory. So it gets some of those features correct. Uh, but, but again, uh, it was difficult to make it precise, so it remained as a, uh, as a nice idea or a picture. Uh, but yeah. Uh, uh, the closest, actually, people went to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to making this precise was a uh, was in the mid 70s, in fact, almost exactly 50 years ago, uh, by uh, Toft. Um, uh, so he came up with the very nice idea of looking at non abelian Yang Mills theories with a gauge group SUN, uh, so and by n matrices, unitary matrices, uh, uh, um, as your gauge fields. Uh, and he had this very nice idea of taking uh, a, a limit of the theory where this uh, uh, n, the rank, becomes very large. Uh, and um, this, uh, 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 in a way, it was due to the fact that, uh, at least in the regime where you want to describe uh, hadrons and so on, the coupling, the effective coupling of QCD is uh, order one. And so there's no way you can, uh, you can use perturbation theory. Uh, so he wanted to find some perturbative parameter. Uh, and he had this insight that one over n uh, could play that role. Uh, and, uh, or rather, actually, one over n squared. And he, and there's some sense in which when n is 3 for QCD, SU3, Yang Mills theory, uh, you would have uh, maybe 1 over 10 is not a bad. Uh, um, a parameter to uh, to uh, to expand around. So I, 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 perhaps many of you may not be familiar with those fundamental insights in this. So I just want to show you very. It's a very simple uh, to to a couple of lines of calculations to show his basic insights. So firstly, what's the theory he's looking at? He's looking at the Yang Mills theory which is like electromagnetism, but so it has an action which is now in terms of uh, field strength, F mu nu, uh, uh, which uh, is a n by n matrix, uh, unitary matrix. Uh, so F mu nu suppressing the matrix indices is like uh, that for Maxwell theory, but there's, it's a non-abelian theory, so it has an extra a piece which involves a commutator uh, of uh, 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 the gauge fields, and that's what 
makes this an interacting theory even without having any matter fields, a pure Young-Mills theory. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so you can write the action in a way such that you scale out the Young-Mills coupling constant uh, uh, outside in this form. It plays the role roughly like h bar. Uh, so what uh, uh, Toft realized is that when you're taking the large n limit, uh, as always when you take limits, you have to scale parameters in the right way to get a meaningful limit. Otherwise, you, you can just get nonsense. So what he realized was that you should actually write this as n over lambda. So in other words, he defined lambda, which is now called the Toft coupling, which is the Young-Mills coupling uh, square times n, and said that you take the large n limit, uh, so n goes to infinity, but you scale the Young-Mills coupling to zero in such a way that you hold this finite. And this is effectively the strength. This soft coupling is the strength uh, that captures the perturbative expansion. Uh, um, so, so that was the first thing about the scaling. Okay, so he got uh, he he uh, got the scaling. Um, but then his two insights. Yes. Yeah. Is there any intuition for why it's g squared n? Uh, yeah, you, you can, uh, maybe uh, what I'm going to say might help in that regard. Uh, so let me just uh, uh, come, back, come back. So he made two important observations. The first observation that is that the Feynman diagrams of the Yang-Mills theory uh, can be viewed as uh, the, uh, you, uh, can be viewed as uh, tilings uh, of a 2D surface, which uh, he would then interpret as the world sheet of a string. A string uh, would trace out a two-dimensional surface as it uh, moves in time. So, but, but anyway, uh, this is an observation which I'll just come to. And the second observation he made, uh, which is that the weight of n uh, associated to a diagram is, uh, is, is essentially given by the genus of that surface. So you have a surface associated to Feynman diagrams, and then there's a, uh, it has a genus, which is nothing but the number of holes. So a surface, to uh, the surface can be at least the closed surfaces for which we'll stick to, uh, are uh, classified by the number of handles or holes that they have. And in fact, uh, uh, this, will be sort of interpreted as loops of strings. So just like, just like particles uh, would have had, uh, uh, you would think of this as a two-loop Feynman diagram of particles, this is effectively like a two-loop Feynman diagram of strings. Uh, so uh, that's an interpretation as of now, but, uh, I'm, but the first part, the observation is this, and which I'll just be able to sketch for you on the blackboard right now. Um, so the way he did this is, is quite nice. Uh, so the first part, so he, he realized that these gauge fields are the, uh, that uh, underlie the theory, uh, they are n by n matrices. And so when you draw Feynman diagrams, you have to draw propagators for these. He drew them as propagators corresponding to these indices i and j. So he sort of had a nice, uh, very suggestive depiction of, of the matrixness of this gauge field uh, in terms of uh, sort of a, uh, so instead of a Feynman diagram in which you just draw it, it's a simple line, he kind of thickened it, so to say, what's called a ribbon graph. Uh, so, and these i, j are, indices that go from 1 to n, they are the 
so to say, color indices. Um, and then you can draw uh, for, I, I'm drawing a, a particular Feynman diagram which would have been like this. Uh, you can sort of fatten it out and draw a diagram like this. So, um, uh, so, uh, uh, so, you, and, uh, so this is a diagram, if you wish, which uh, you can view as a kind of a tiling of a two-dimensional surface, in this case like a sphere. You can think of these as the tiles, and, uh, and you think of the outside as well. Uh, so think of this uh, on a sphere. You can also draw higher genus uh, uh, things on uh, uh, surfaces with higher handles, but um, I, I won't draw that. So this is roughly how, you can, for each Feynman diagram, you can kind of thicken it out and draw it as a tiling of a 2D surface using this observation. So that was this. Now what about this? This also follows very easily uh, if you start with the action of this form, because what do you have? When, what is a proper, uh, so you have a Feynman diagram. A Feynman diagram has some number of edges. It has some vertices, and it has some faces. Uh, um, and so now, what is the weight associated to any such Feynman diagram? So for each edge of the Feynman diagram, an edge corresponds to a propagator. Uh, and the propagator comes from the inverse of the quadratic term in this. That's just the, uh, 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 the uh, way you uh, define the propagator. So, so for if you have a diagram with um, E edges, it gives you a weight N over lambda to the minus E, because you get a factor of N over lambda to the minus one for each edge. Uh, for each vertex, a vertex comes from, say, the cubic or the quartic interaction when you expand out uh, this. So that comes with a factor of N over lambda. So you get N over lambda to the number of vertices uh, of the diagram. Uh, and then you have to, when you consider a Feynman diagram like this, you have to sort of sum over all the possible color uh, values that can go around in the loop. Uh, and uh, so for, uh, and the number of color indices in each face, uh, I said i and j go from 1 to n, so you get n to the f, the number of faces. And you can rewrite this slightly as and uh, maybe many of you will recognize this combination V minus E plus F is really what is uh, due to the famous result of Euler, the genus of the corresponding surface that you associate with this diagram. So this is n to the 2 minus 2g, and you can write this as, uh, so in terms of the genus, and then you have this perturbative parameter lambda, uh, and uh, the number of faces uh, uh, is what, uh, for a given genus, the perturbation expansion parameter is lambda, which is related to the number of faces. So this is the expansion that makes sense. Uh, if you try any of the other scalings, you'll get infinity or zero. Uh, so you won't get non-zero amplitudes. Yes. So there are different Feynman diagrams, which, I mean, depending on the way the color indices are, the thing, there could be different Feynman diagrams corresponding to, uh, or rather, different surface diagrams, or these ribbon diagrams corresponding to a given Feynman diagram. And there is a sense in which, I mean, you, I didn't, for, uh, at the moment, this was just a suggestive interpretation of this as a, a sort of a, uh, as a world sheet of an open string, and indeed, that's what 
you can think of this as some propagator of an open string. Uh, and there's a sense in which the open string reduces to Yang Mills theory uh, at when the tension is very small. Uh, sorry, the, t uh, the tension is very large. Uh, um, uh, so that all the higher excitations are gapped out. Uh, so, uh, so indeed, there's a way in which you can think of this. Uh, but at the moment, I'm just not. Uh, uh, insisting on any interpretation. I'm just giving the suggestive picture that Toft outlined purely from the Young Mills theory that there's a sense in which you can organize the Feynman diagrams in terms of the genus, which is like, a, uh, uh, I mean, firstly, in terms of surfaces, which are like world sheets of strings, and furthermore, that 1 over n square plays the role of, uh, so the 1 over n square Sub is the loop expansion parameter. It's the loops of the strings. So, and then there's this other parameter lambda, which is the perturbative parameter. So there are two parameters which will play a role. So, okay. So, um, so the uh, so uh, so uh, so that was uh, suggestive, but. Uh, but all, this, this picture, again, people found it quite remarkable, but uh, didn't have a way to understand what this string might be that underlies this picture. Uh, and that, it was not until 97 or 98 when Maldasena um, uh, made a very precise, made a sort of precise, uh, gave a, gave a series of examples where uh, this could be made very precise. And his insight essentially relied on the discovery of Polchinski uh, shortly after he wrote those notes, uh, that, uh, uh, that there are non-perturbative excitations in string theory called D-brains, which have a kind of a uh, genus-like aspect to them. Uh, on the one hand, they, you can think of them as some kind of defects in space-time, some kind of domain walls or something, uh, and uh, but they carry energy and mass, uh, maybe cosmic strings uh, familiar to people uh, in this audience, so, uh, uh, but they therefore carry energy and momentum and therefore sort of modify the space-time around them. So that's one aspect, if you wish. So these are, they modify the, the space-time. That's one way to view them. In, uh, but there's a, they have a second kind of a, the, the second way to, uh, so this, if you wish, is the closed string avatar because closed strings, and I didn't quite mention this, but closed strings are the ones that contain gravity, and that was sort of what was responsible for this, uh, whereas open strings sort of are related to gauge theories. So, so one aspect was this. But the second aspect is that you could think of these defects as the locus in space-time on which open strings can end. Uh, and so these are open string boundaries. Uh, and uh, uh, so, the, so that these two aspects, which at first sight seem to have nothing to do with each other, uh, um, and in fact, what Maldesena did was sort of push this to its logical conclusion uh, that the two must be equivalent. Uh, and, uh, and, and lo and behold, that gave rise to a surprising equivalence between, uh, so, uh, so you had a, a large N four-dimensional, in this case, a super Yang-Mills theory. Uh, and and a particular 10D closed string theory. So you, uh, he took a certain limit in which the open strings were just the Young Mills degrees of freedom, and then well, this corresponding space time uh, is a very special space time. In fact, it has a component which uh, you can think of as a
So you should think of it as a, uh, a spacetime with a kind of a boundary, uh, and uh, which extends, uh, so which extends in an extra direction. So you should think of a boundary which is, say, Minkowski spacetime or Euclidean spacetime, and then this spacetime geometry. Uh, the full geometry is sort of like a uh, is one in which you uh, you put together these slices of this R, but they're kind of warped in the extra direction. So this is a, a curved geometry, the antidecitta geometry, uh, in one higher dimension. And in the particular case uh, here, uh, in the 4D angles, you would have a ADS5 geometry, dual to, uh, and at least that's one component of the geometry. And you can view the quantum field theory as living on this geometry, uh, that's where this young Mills theory, if you wish, uh, can be viewed as uh, living. Where, and the kind of strings that one had, uh, this picture uh, over here, now made a lot of sense because you actually had a fat string here, but that was really like a thin string uh, that was a shadow or a projection of a thin string in this extra dimension. So you you could sort of have your cake and eat it too. You so you had uh, you you know that in Yang Mills theories there are these flux tubes, but there are these fat flux tubes. Uh, uh, but you now understand them better as being really like a projection of a flux tube in one higher dimension. And in fact, this helped to reconcile the the this discrepancy of these scattering amplitudes that I mentioned over there. In, uh, you do reproduce the same kind of soft power law scattering. Uh, so, um, so let me uh, 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 tell you a little bit in the, I don't know, in the last five, ten minutes of this uh, uh, thing, a bit more about uh, this uh, uh, theory in, by looking at the parameter space. So the parameter space, roughly speaking, and I already introduced this in the context of the Stoft, uh, it can be viewed as the two parameters. There's the n and the lambda from the point of view of the gauge theory. Uh, and you can sort of, I've plotted 1 over n square on this axis, and lambda, which is gn square n on this axis. So this is how the strength of the coupling grows. The lambda grows this way. In this dictionary, when you relate these two, this lambda translates to effectively the curvature uh, or the inverse curvature uh, of this ADS spacetime measured in the units of the string tension. The string has a basic uh, length scale, a mass scale, tension scale, and the, so this T is the tension, and this is the curvature of ADS. So this is the limit where the curvature is very small. So this is going to infinity. Uh, uh, and that's almost flat antidecitor spacetime. As you go over here, the, the curvature becomes comparable to the string scale. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so that's, what, that's why I've called it stringiness on this axis. This way is increasing stringiness. But this way is sort of the quantumness of the theory, uh, because this 1 over n square, as I said over here, is like a loop expansion parameter of these strings, of these closed strings, which is effectively in, a, in the closed string interpretation of uh, quantum gravity. That's effectively counting the Newton constant, the, uh, the quantum parameter of uh, gravity. So. So this is the vertical axis, and you increase it from here. So what Maldacena did was, in a sense, show the equivalence in, I mean, he, he was, uh, strictly speaking, the regime of his, uh, his uh, uh, discussion was in this regime where you can trust the gravity solution that these uh, D brains create. Uh, you are in the classical regime. Uh, so that's this corner, this very 
Um, uh, from the point of view of uh, gravity, it's a very well understood corner. Uh, but, but you see from the point of view of the gauge theory, it's an ultra strong coupling limit of the gauge theory. So, uh, so that's one thing I want you to, uh, to take away. So in this corner, what you learn is that there's classical gravity, Einstein gravity, or maybe some variants of it, that tells you about str ultra strong gauge theories, ultra strongly coupled. So the information flow is, in a sense, this way. You use classical gravity to learn about uh, these ultra strong. Gates theories. So what do you learn out of all this? I mean, there's lots you can learn. And in fact, it's amazing that you can actually check the precise uh, predictions of, from gravity or corrections of gravity uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the strongly interacting uh, gauge theories. In some cases, you can actually use the supersymmetry to actually compute things in the gauge theory. Uh, even to very strong coupling. And it's quite amazing that these two formalisms, which predate string theory, have to harmonize in this way. Uh, so it, uh, but just to be concrete, let me kind of somewhat end with telling you three things. Because uh, in a sense, for a physicist, I think nothing warms the heart of a physicist more than seeing a nice formula. So I'll show you three nice formulas. Uh, so I think, and I think all of you should be able to appreciate that. It's, uh, I think, three formulas which, follow, which you've learned from just looking at this corner of the parameter space. So what are these three things? So these are uh, things for theories which have a gravity dual, in, which have a large n, very strongly coupled gauge theories with a gravity dual. I won't explain any of these. In fact, you can use these as conversation starters for uh, <laughs> between uh, program uh, participants. So, uh, so I'll just write down the formulas. Uh, the, so one is a universal formula for viscosity to entropy density. So this is the shear viscosity of uh, strongly interacting plasma of these gauge uh, power fields. And there's a, a sort of a nice dimensionless quantity, uh, which uh, uh, so this is often denoted eta over s. s is the entropy density, actually. And It's just h bar over 4 pi times the Boltzmann constant. Uh, uh, and this is a universal result for a class of theories. At some point, uh, people thought there might be a bound, but that doesn't seem to be the case. But many things, including the quark gluon plasma, seems to be uh, having this order of magnitude, uh, at least. So this is an order of uh, substantially smaller than many of the materials we see otherwise this ratio if you actually compute it. But uh, so this is Polycastro's on Starinets um, and Cawthon's star, Starinets. And it led to something called the fluid gravity duality, which you may, some of you may have heard in the last colloquium. Um, but I won't spend more time on that. The other thing, another one is a universal formula for the entanglement entropy uh, of a subregion. So this is a measure uh, of a quantum system that has become increasingly important in many areas, including condensed matter physics. And uh, the statement is that the entanglement entropy, which is the von Neumann entropy, has, a, has in this limit uh, where you have a gravity dual, um, a very nice universal form, um, which you can, uh, so wh what is this? So again, in this picture that I drew over there, supposing now you have a subregion of your, in this Yang-Mills theory, uh, 
and you have this, you can consider an extremal surface in the bulk. So this is an extremal surface bounded by this region on the boundary that you're interested in. So you want to compute the entanglement of the degrees of freedom here with the rest of the system. Uh, the claim is that the von Neumann entropy would be given by the area of this extremal surface. This is the gamma. So gamma A. Uh, and again, with some constants. So this is the so-called Ryu Takanagi formula, which was then developed by people here, including Veronica, Mukund, and uh, 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 Tadashi, uh, to uh, in a more covariant way. Uh, so this is, again, a very beautiful formula that comes out of this, and for which we uh, now understand, uh, uh, I mean, we understand it in many ways. We understand corrections to it, etc. And then, finally, the last thing is a sort of a universal bound on, a, on the chaos exponent, which is a kind of a Lyapunov index, which measures how, how ergodic a system is. Uh, so this lambda you should think of as this Lyapunov index, so it's sort of measuring how fast things uh, diverge uh, exponentially. Uh, this lambda, in fact, the claim is that it's, there's a bound, which is also very simple. And uh, 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 this is supposed to be whole, uh, whole for any unitary system. And the equality holds in this strong coupling limit, uh, where you have gravity as the dual. So, but you, you learn something about any quantum system, that there's a universal bound. One thing that's sort of common in all these things, with the way it arises, is to do with black holes and their relation, the role that black holes in this geometry, the, in this bulk geometry, uh, they map to sort of finite temperature systems in the, in the gauge theory or the boundary theory, and that's what enables you to extract these statements just one second. Uh, the statements which, uh, uh, which are in many ways uh, quite striking. By the way, this is Maldasena, Schenker, and Stanford. Uh, and, um, uh, and of course, it relies on a sort of a match of even the Bekenstein Hawking entropy with microscopic. So all this is to say that ADS CFT, I think, just can't be ignored. It sort of, uh, uh, and one of the goals, one of the many goals uh, of many of people here is to uh, is to sort of demystify this, in a sense, a miracle. And and you've already learned so much from just this corner, and you can see this whole space, which is relatively unexplored. And uh, so that's, I think, uh, um, so it, many universal questions about how general is this? Uh, how do you go away from these gravity duels? Uh, and uh, so these are some of the themes being explored in this workshop. And uh, how does a quantum space-time emerge? And that's where ideas from information theory uh, are, uh, are playing a role. So these, just to give you a glimpse of, uh, I hope you got a glimpse of some of the uh, things that uh, people are doing. I didn't mention so much particle physics and cosmology, but uh, again, many of the ideas from ADS-CFT have played a role in scenarios in particle physics, the randall sundram scenario, the KKLT construction uh, for cosmology. So, uh, and I think understanding this better will lead to further progress in that. So thank you. I think that was mine. Yeah, right. I have a question about uh, sort of the universal, the different universal formulas there. So does the derived difference say from this corner of the lambda to the n of so, uh, uh, for large n, uh, very strongly coupled systems which have a gravity dual, there's a kind of. Uh, so that's the uh, universal in the sense that. Uh, they, they're all captured by Einstein gravity or modif small modifications thereof. Uh, so that's why it's universal. So for instance, 
black holes and Einstein gravity sort of saturate this bound. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, you, you kind of excite black holes uh, and they settle down and their sort of hydrodynamics is essentially governed by this. So, so in some ways, uh, and I didn't spend much time on it at all, but uh, uh, the black holes in this corner tell you uh, a lot about systems which you wouldn't have otherwise guessed that they seem to be the fastest scrambler and so on. I mean, uh, the remarkable things that we, uh, we are learning just by viewing things through as sort of dual to black holes. Yes, so N indeed is the number of colors, this SUN. Uh, so QCD has N equals to three, the SU3. Uh, so that uh, is, of course, seems very far from large N. But for many things, it does, uh, the large N approximation does seem to give um, uh, a reasonable description of uh, even QCD. And this was something people explored in the 80s. Uh, so, yeah, so N is the number of colors. Uh, non is an extra property? Uh, the the non-abelianness comes from the fact that the gauge group is SUN, which is a non-abelian uh, gauge group, and that's why you have these extra terms as opposed to the Maxwell theory. Right. You didn't write the color indices, but that's Yes, uh, exactly. That's trivial. You can view these as matrices, and that's why there's a commutator of matrices. Uh. Yeah, I think uh, very far, I mean, as you know. Uh, I, I guess uh, it's indeed true. Uh, uh, this uh, strings naturally arise as these one-dimensional flux lines, uh, uh, and it's uh, related also to these, um, the counting here. Uh, but, uh, well, there's at least one example where you might hope to make progress, the one you know, the six-dimensional theories which have degrees of freedom that grow like n cubed rather than n square, and which would seem to be associated with membrane-like excitations. And there is, of course, this whole family of theories that goes from string theory at weak coupling to these theories at strong coupling. So you might hope to see the membrane perhaps emerge from the string theory. I think that's the only place I can see a immediate, immediate sort of a route to getting a toehold on these more general excitations like membranes and other things. Uh, but indeed, yeah, they are there. So yeah, one of the messages is that just exploring even a small corner has taught you quite a lot. So I think it's very useful to go into the sort of the wild, so to say, over there. What is so you did a great here? job of summarizing <laughs> progress. Right? I mean, things that were, in some sense, nobody would necessarily predict it would have been the impact of the work, I think, some of these. Um, you know, 20 years from now, what would be the glorious success that you and the community would love to have? Well, we uh, need a home run. Let's call these singles and doubles. Let's <laughs> yeah, well. Uh, it, one immediate one in the context of uh, uh, the, what I was saying, I mean, from that perspective, is just finding what's the closed string dual for QCD. 
for the strong interactions. I mean, if we have good control, we have an alternative way to understand the spectrum scattering amplitudes of QCD from string theory. I think that'll teach us a lot. That's one thing. Of course, there's, uh, uh, I think, some of the major questions that string theory set out to address in particle physics and cosmology, I think, are there. And in fact, in the discussion we had last week, uh, clearly a lot of people were keen to have uh, at least simple models of time-dependent backgrounds in string theory, which could go towards describing string th in dissertor space, our universe. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, whether there's even a holographic picture of visitor space, etc. So these are some of the questions I think uh, which would help string theory make uh, contact. There are many more. I'm sure you ask people, you'll get many opinions. But I, I, I think they are uh, they are a, a first step towards uh, uh, towards understanding QCD. This, uh, in some ways, you've sort of integrated out some extra degrees of freedom corresponding to the extra dimensions, and that's given you an effect of uh, string theory uh, description in, for a long fat string. Um, uh, from the structure of those terms in the effective uh, string theory. It should give you, in principle, some clues about the nature of the extra dimension, which would geometrize the additional. Um, so uh, something that I didn't mention is that it, there's an intuition, not very precise, but an intuition that the extra dimension refers to the renormalization group scale or the energy scale uh, in the theory. So in some ways, you're geometrizing that uh, through this uh, picture. So the structure of the effective action might tell you how to kind of piece together the geometry. Yeah, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. I think you know various pieces and you're trying to fit them together. <laughs>